But the manifestation has to be not about you, it has to be about the other. Doing something to improve the life of, an, of, of another, caring for another, uh, having an aspiration or intention to make the world a better place. When that is your goal, all the other stuff will come if you want that. Uh, but if you're doing it in reverse, uh, many people will fail and many people will be disappointed and, and unhappy. What causes suffering is attachment and craving. So you have to separate that from manifesting your intention. And what I mean by that is if, uh, I mean, frankly, so much of what we do is the journey, it's not the destination. And people get lost in the destination, but they're not living in the present moment, enjoying the journey. And so you also have to separate yourself from that. You can improve the lives of others. You can improve your own life by having an open heart, embracing people, and demonstrating uh, this unconditional love. And when you're able to sit with that and hold that, that is the most powerful thing in the world. And whether you're, you're able to do that for a second or a lifetime, it is elevating, it's profound, and that is the purpose for why we're here in this world. Many people give away their self-agency. As I said earlier, people have an immense, immense power within themselves. They just don't know it or believe it. And when you're able to get in touch with that, uh, it changes everything. Dr. James Doty. Oh my, welcome to the podcast. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. And I, I'm, I'm excited about our conversation, although I have no clue where it's going, but we shall see. <laughs> we shall see. I just finished your book yet to be released, Mind Magic, The Neuroscience of Manifestation and How It Changes Everything. I loved it. I think it should be required reading because, you know, there are so many places I was thinking, where can I start this interview? But I think what I just keep coming back to is, don't we get manifestation wrong? Don't you think popular culture has gotten it just like greed, 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 me, me, me. I want a Ferrari. I want a diamond ring. I want that boat. I want that island. Well, you're absolutely correct. And unfortunately, the, the problem is that uh, the nature of Western society Mm -hmm. is one which promotes conspicuous consumption and self-interest. Mm -hmm. And there's this false narrative that unfortunately so many people have bought into that my life will be perfect if I have a million dollars or if I live in a big house or if I have this uh, position and all my worries uh, will be over. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it, of course, you know, all, most of us would say, well, that's completely not true. But the fact of the matter is that is what a lot of people strive for. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple issues with that. One is popular culture promotes these types of narratives where you see either influencers who uh, want to be something, or you actually see uh, very wealthy people showing off their lifestyle. And my argument is that the people who are doing that actually don't understand what is necessary to fill the emptiness that each of us has. Mm -hmm. And so they're confused or have been misled by this narrative that, well, I, I live in this big house, I drive this car, and all these people are looking at me, and they're, they want to be like me. And therefore, uh, uh, I keep doing it to get more of this, uh, what I would say, uh, food without calories because mm -hmm. it's very transitory and you get nothing from it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the uh, reality is that people are confused by what they think they need versus what they actually need. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this is where uh, books like the secret or uh, the prosperity gospel that uh, talks about me, 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 I get this, I want that, and therefore life will be perfect for me, is uh, a, a complete misrepresentation, I think, uh, for what manifestation is. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, and the reality is all of us on some level are manifesting or trying to, because that's the nature of how, you know, we aspire for things to be different. The problem is most of us get it wrong. And what I mean by that is that how we evolved as a species is actually to care for the other. And of course, if you look at the evolution of our species from hunter uh, gathered tribes or even the nuclear family, when our offspring, as an example, are hungry or suffering in pain, whatever, we have this motivation, which is built into our genes to care, to alleviate the pain, uh, uh, to nurture. And when we do that, we're actually rewarded. Because not only do we get the release of oxytocin and other uh, neurotransmitters uh, that make us feel good or or affect our reward and pleasure centers, but the other thing that happens is actually our physiology works its best when you care for another. And this is why the Dalai Lama uh, has made the comment, uh, being kind to others is the only time it's okay to be selfish. And what he means by that Mm -hmm. is that when you care for another, you're receiving benefit. And that is how we should look at manifestation because the way we evolve then uh, actually gives us the tools to manifest. But the manifestation has to be not about you. It has to be about the other doing something to improve the life of, an, of, of another, caring for another, uh, having an aspiration or intention to make the world a better place. When that is your goal, all the other stuff will come if you want that. Uh, but if you're doing it in reverse, uh, many people will fail and many people will be disappointed and, and unhappy. Mm-hmm. And so I think uh, that's um, what the book, uh, is mostly about. There are other things, obviously, which we can talk about or which you'll probably bring up. Yes, I have so many notes here. Oh my, I mean, truly, like, is an hour enough? I don't know. Like, <laughs> there are so many questions I have. But you have actual firsthand experience of this because you start the book, by the way, never has a better first line of a, of a first book been written. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you going to share it? <laughs> I think I'm going to call, uh, that's why I'm going to call this interview, actually. I mean, I love it. The universe doesn't give a fuck about you. And I love how you wrap with this at the end. You must read the book, friends, when it comes out 2024. But when I first read that, I was like, I already like this book. I'm intrigued. And then of course you go into your story. Can you say what you mean by that? The universe, well, doesn't the universe love us unconditionally? Isn't the universe just always rooting for us? Like, doesn't it have us? Like, tell tell us what you mean by this. Sure, sure. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, uh, John Hamm, the actor uh, of mm. Mad Men, He's a, he's a good friend of mine, and uh, he was reading it, and he said, well, at best, the universe is indifferent, and I think uh, that's probably uh, the case. But what I meant by that is so many people uh, seek affirmation from outside of themselves, uh, and it gets back to what we were talking about earlier. It's like, well, if I just had this job and people will look up to me, I'll be okay, or if I make this amount of money, or if I live in this house, or I have this job, then I will be okay. And and I have to be honest with you, I was in that same boat uh, for a long time, because in my case, when you grow up poor, Mm -hmm. you have this naive notion that what's necessary for you to be happy is to be rich. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, Uh, Numerous studies have demonstrated that if you have your basic needs met, whether it's, you know, home or a place to live, uh, security, food, uh, then you don't need really uh, much more. And in fact, what's a horribly sad thing is you see people come from, um, uh, let's say, the third world Mm -hmm. who essentially have their needs met and they're incredibly happy uh, uh, because they're with their family, uh, they're with their community, because that's how we evolved to live. And that's when our physiology works its best. The problem is that the West has spread a narrative Mm -hmm. that happiness involves having stuff. Mm -hmm. And this is what's so sad is you see people come from third world countries where frankly, especially in Eastern uh, countries where they have these really 
uh, profound uh, practices, whether it's Buddhism or Hinduism uh, or whatever, uh, they have these profound practices that have helped them uh, maintain their communities. Then they come to the West and they get caught up in this ridiculous, conspicuous consumption. And, you know, they'll come here and because they don't either have access or education, then they end up, let's say, uh, you know, being a janitor. And there's nothing wrong with being a janitor. I have been a janitor myself. And there's nothing wrong with digging ditches. I've done that myself. But Mm -hmm. the point is, that's not going to get you the big house and all the stuff that you you have uh, deluded yourself that you think is necessary to make you happy. And I can tell you from my own experience, uh, whether it was uh, graduating from medical school or becoming a neurosurgeon or a professor or being CEO of a, a billion dollar company or whatever it was, every time I reached the pinnacle, there was nothing there for me. Uh, and I and and it's interesting because I had all of these friends who would sit there, and go, "Wow, Jim, you're really rocking, man! You got all these babes, and you can go here, and you drive a Ferrari, and you live in this big house." And I was never more miserable in my entire life because I kept seeking affirmation from outside myself. And the reality is that, uh, and uh, thus the quote is, "Only you can make yourself happy." And that's by accepting yourself. It's by understanding what's truly important, friendships, relationships, family, Mm -hmm. and uh, leaving this idea of stuff behind and understanding that it's okay to say, I have enough. Mm -hmm. And, uh, And when you're able to do that, you will be gloriously happy. You know, watching a sunrise costs nothing, but it's profound. Uh, swimming in the ocean, all sorts of these things. They're absolutely profound. Now, listen, uh, and I'll tell you, uh, I have had multiple Ferraris, multiple Porsches, <laughs> yes. lived in uh, you know huge houses, uh, flown on private jets. Mm-hmm. Is it fun? Sure, it's fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, do I need it? No, not at all. If it goes away tomorrow, uh, it doesn't bother me a bit. And this is the other aspect is, again, it's not denying yourself either. You you don't have to be a renunciate uh, to uh, live, quote unquote, a good life or or caring for others. Uh, But you have to understand that so much of this stuff is completely unimportant. It's very compelling though, right? Like we can really get sucked into this. I mean, someone can live their life completely obsessed with more, more, more. You know, the statement you just shared, you know, I have enough. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that, like actually ever in my life. Interestingly, apart from Jim Carrey, who you reference often throughout the book. I mean, maybe we could talk about him for a second because he's also, of course, here on my list. And I loved how he, uh, when he he shifted the question to what do they want, right? How can he be of service? How there was such a big shift for him. Could you speak to that for a moment in the context of Mind Magic? Well, sure. You know, again, this is where we get confused because we create the narrative that it's about us. Mm -hmm. And this is where we get lost. Uh, uh, And it's really about being of service. And the example of Jim Carrey is that he was miserable and he was trying so hard uh, because he was trying to be something versus the difference in understanding what people actually really wanted and needed. And that was for him simply to be who he was and not be focused on success or, uh, again, uh, I would call them false narratives of, uh, false narratives of, of success. And, and once he changed, everything changed for him. And in fact, it's interesting because, uh, when you listen to him, uh, talk, uh, there's a depth and profoundness, uh, to what he says. And I would also comment that if you look at the lives of many people in comedy, uh, they oftentimes have been filled with uh, suffering and pain. And being a comedian sort of externalizes that and allows you to sit with that. And even people like Tutu, uh, Archbishop Tutu or the Dalai Lama, 
who've been through immense suffering in their lives, they also have great senses, uh, sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think that is another important aspect and also, uh, not to take yourself too seriously. Mm, which is very hard for a lot of us, right? It's like, it has to be perfect. And you speak about perfectionism in the book. And I mean, when I was going through this, a few things that I just thought that really stood out to me were, well, okay, a few things. Uh, realizing that everything is bigger than you, that really creating a switch within you, that the most significant vibration we can have will always come from our hearts. Knowing what's subjectively salient, like what is most important, metacognition, so actually tracking, monitoring our thoughts. Okay, value tagging. Do you see all the, this is such a must read. Oh my. You know, actually, I would like to go straight into, because I think this is, again, we're speaking about the practicality of manifesting, the filing clerk and the bloodhound. These are all related. So when, uh, as you said, we're, all almost always manifesting all the time, consciously or unconsciously, if we want to welcome something in, maybe it's better health, right? Or it's a, a love in our life or some, maybe it is some, some type of possession. What's the importance of repetition? What is the importance of feeling it with an elevated emotion? Well, uh, let me just uh, go through one other aspect that people don't appreciate. Uh, mm -hmm. Our sensory organs, uh, which make us who we are at the end of the day, because that information comes in and the brain processes it, mm -hmm. uh, combined actually with the information that's there uh, for good or bad, mm -hmm. uh, um, we're only pro able to process about 50 to 100 bits of information a second when in fact uh, about six to 10 million bits of information come in every second. Now, a large, large percentage of that goes to maintaining our body homeostasis, you know, how our body mm -hmm. functions. And it's all at a subconscious level. And in fact, when we talk about manifesting, we say, well, everybody does it all the time. Uh, we are uh, manifesting in the sense that we say, oh, I want that. But the problem is there's not necessarily consistency uh, with that. Mm -hmm. And there are actually techniques whereby you can actually embed these things into your subconscious that then become very powerful. And uh, this is this aspect of uh, uh, the bloodhound. And what was the other one? Because the I filing clerk of bloodhound. The, yeah, the yeah. filing yeah. clerk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, because once you're able to embed that, and, you know, I talk about cognitive networks in your brain, uh, mm -hmm. the attention network, the salience network, the uh, executive control network, the default mm -hmm. mode network, and how they interact. Mm -hmm. When you're able to then consciously embed something into your unconscious, then it becomes very powerful. And then you activate the bloodhound, if you will. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, and I'm sure you probably experienced it, if you're at a party and you know it's very noisy, if somebody says your name mm -hmm. from across the room, you suddenly turn to it. How were you able to filter all of the stuff that's going on to focus on that? And that our our name, if you will, is deeply embedded in us, right? Mm -hmm. And so the same thing can occur uh, with whatever it is you're trying to manifest. And oftentimes, we don't even understand how our subconscious um, helps us get what we want. And what I mean by that, as an example, if you look at the popular AI stuff that's coming out, yes. uh, uh, <clears throat> They don't, they don't even know how you sometimes get the answer, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. it's, and in some ways, it's like your subconscious. You don't know the processes that are going on to get you there. Mm -hmm. As an example, uh, let's say you were seeking uh, some sort of an investment in an idea or company you started. Mm -hmm. Well, when you embed it into your subconscious, as an example, let's say you're at a coffee shop, you may then suddenly be attuned to the fact that the fellow next to you is talking about uh, uh, his interest in this project and how he would like to uh, invest in something like that, but he hasn't found the right uh, uh, you know, partner. And so these types of events, which we can use the term synchronicity, yes. uh, uh, become more commonplace. And again, when you are practicing this, and you talked about repetition, it's like anything. It's like whether it's physical exercise, uh, whether, frankly, uh, 
compassion or, or self-compassion, there is a necessity that you repeat this over and over again. And uh, again, if you look at sports physiology, uh, you talk to top level athletes, they repeatedly live in their head about the event they're competing in to the point where they see every aspect of it all the way, let's say, through the end of a, of a race. And uh, the best way to do this is to use every one of your sensory organs to strengthen that embedding. And this is why repetition and using these techniques, such as you write it down. So you're doing a physical act. You're reading it. You're saying it over and over. You're listening to it. Then you visualize it and you can almost taste it in front of you. You see yourself in that position. All of those things increase the likelihood of you manifesting your intention. Now, the caveat is as follows. Mm -hmm. One, uh, what you think is best is not always best in terms of what you're trying to manifest. And what I mean by that is you may have this, as an example, let's say getting into medical school. Mm -hmm. You may say, well, I want to go to this school and you've got this whole view there. And then suddenly, for whatever the reason is, you're accepted to this other school, but you're not accepted to that. Well, the goal was to get into medical school. And you may have created a narrative around that. But for whatever reason, your subconscious has moved you in a different direction. Or you sit there and say, well, I uh, want to do this by this date. And again, uh, it may not happen on that date. It may be six months later. And, uh, and so you have to understand that it's not necessarily absolute. There are other aspects that you may not, uh, on a conscious level, appreciate that ultimately guide you uh, uh, in a different direction. Or, in fact, uh, some of our uh, intentions uh, may not be healthy for us, or frankly, just are not possible. And so uh, that's also something you have to keep in mind. But again, the other aspect of this is what causes suffering is attachment and craving. So you have to separate that from manifesting your intention. And what I mean by that is if I mean, frankly, so much of what we do is the journey. It's not the destination. And people get lost in the destination, but they're not living in the present moment, enjoying the journey. Mm -hmm. And so you also have to separate yourself from that. If something doesn't happen the way you think it should or want, there may be a whole variety of other circumstances which you don't understand and uh, therefore, it's not going to manifest. So nothing's 100%. Nothing happens on the timeline necessarily that you want. But what I would suggest is if you use these techniques, more likely than not, compared to if you didn't, you are going to be able to manifest. Mm. What about those situations where, because this happened to actually two friends of mine in two different situations recently. One wanted a specific number for her house sale. She had a, and she was like, I'm feeling good about it. I'm visualizing it. I'm doing all the things. You know, you, I think that sometimes we think ah, I can manipulate this with the right thought work. Like I can get it. She didn't get the number that she wanted. And another friend of mine came out with a book earlier this year. She did a lot. She put a lot of action into it. And she, there was an elevated emotion. I did see it, but she didn't like hit a specific list that she wanted to hit. And sometimes they come to me and they're like, well, why did it didn't work? The things that the things didn't work. Like, what would you say in those situations? Well, because what you're focused on was not the right thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're focused on reaching a number, that's about you. I want to reach that number because it will benefit me because I'll make more money. Mm -hmm. versus saying, you know, my house is a bargain and the person who's going to buy it is going to be a special person who is going to appreciate the effort, the love, the work I put into this home. And I want to find that person who really appreciates it. You see, you're doing the same thing, but it's a completely different way of looking yeah. at it. 
And it's like the the book uh, that this person, well, what is her goal? Oh, I'm on the New York Times bestseller list. I'm important. It's about me. Yeah, that was yeah. the goal. Yeah. It's about me versus saying, you know, I have created a book that I believe is going to help a lot of people. It's irrelevant if it's on the New York Times bestseller list. Everything is irrelevant. If that book can help one person mm. to improve their lives, mm -hmm. then it was all worthwhile. I don't need anything else. And you see, this is the confusion that people, because they're so focused on what I want, yeah. And it's about it's about me versus looking at it from the perspective of the other. When you do it that way, that changes everything. And that's the whole point of this book. Yeah. What if someone is resolute, though? What if they're thinking, because this friend of mine who didn't hit, it was the New York Times bestseller list, someone else, another one of our friends did. They had the exact same goal. And so she hit her goal, right? So she's very happy about it, celebrated it. This other friend didn't. And what if she's like, yeah, I actually don't care about that thing. <laughs> you know, like elevating the lives of loads of people or even one person. Maybe they actually both even had that in common, but they both had the goal. One hit it, one didn't. Like in that situation, are you like, is there actually then a secret intention? Is there something else driving us? Like, Well, uh, again, uh, oftentimes many of these things are out of our control and all of our manifestation techniques aren't helpful and things mm -hmm. happen and they just happen. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, so I obviously don't know either of those parties. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, I would like to believe that the person who hit that goal uh, had some sort of a different uh, worldview, but they may not have. I, I mean, look, I, I, there are quote unquote influencers or people go, you know, I wanted that uh, Porsche or that Ferrari and I got it and here I am and here's my picture standing next to it. Okay. Uh, uh, is that healthy? I don't think so, but th that's not for me to decide. From my perspective, mm -hmm. my focus uh, is to try to be of service because mm -hmm. I know both for myself but also for uh, my physiology and uh, uh, how I walk in this world, it's a much better path for me. I'm not trying to push it on anybody, but right. I would suggest to you that uh, having a constantly selfish outlook about how somehow you deserve all the things that you want uh, isn't helpful. It makes people unhappy. And your friend who didn't get on the New York Times bestseller list is a classic example. She's miserable or he's miserable. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't make it. Uh, I'm a failure. Uh, I deserved it. Blah, 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 blah. No one cares. And uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> Yeah. And no one's also looking at you thinking you're a failure because everyone's also just consumed with their own stuff. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, and well, you know, it's funny you say that because, it, 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 you know, people will go out of their house and they'll go, oh, I've got to have my, you know, tie done and my suit this and this. But the reality, nobody gives a shit. If, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it's funny because I have a teenage, an older teenage son and he's like, well, I want to look this. Uh, and I, and Oftentimes, I'll just irritate him because I'll go out in a sweatshirt and, and sweats and flip flops. And, and he'll go, well, how can you go around like that? And I said, because I don't give a fuck. I, 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 I'm not here. And I, this isn't performance art. Either you like me, you don't like me. And the fact of the matter is, you know, let's say if you go to a Ferrari dealership, yeah, they may judge you, uh, but the fact of the matter, if you walk in in, in sweats and a, a sweatshirt and you don't give a shit, that actually makes them even more, who is this guy? You, you know what I mean? And so, uh, you know, uh, 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 frankly, uh, look, I'm who I am and, and mm -hmm. I do my thing. And uh, look, uh, I it works for me. Yeah. It's funny. I was, uh, we have a farmer's market by where I live and every Sunday, uh, there's a booth I go to where they sell a particular type of sandwich, which I like, and that's sort of my Sunday treat. Mm -hmm. And so I always end up uh, because the owner actually is the cook. So the back of this tent or whatever is open, and he's back there cooking, and I usually pull up a chair and bullshit with him while I'm eating my sandwich. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and again, I'm probably dressed in sweats and whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this woman comes up to me, she goes, uh, "Are you Doctor Doty?" And I said, uh, "Yeah, I am." She goes, 
I can't believe it, that you're sitting there. Well, uh, and I'm like, well, what do you mean? She goes, well, but you're famous. I'm like, well, uh, well, first of all, I'm not particularly famous, but uh, I appreciate you saying that. But, uh, you know, what, what am I supposed to do? Be, you know, dressed to the nines uh, on Sunday, walking around uh, like a peacock, uh, uh, wanting people to look at me? You know, eating uh, at the Ritz, only eating at the Ritz. Yeah, yes, exactly. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's what I should have said. Well, I just came from the Ritz, but I, I'm, <laughs> I'm here because, you know, I, this is a charity case and I bought this sandwich to make this. <laughs> Isn't it so interesting how our minds work, how we care about judgment, how we like, we're even unknowingly, like what, just kind of what goes on inside of us. Another thing that I think sometimes too is if someone didn't get the exact manifestation that they want, right, say... I didn't get it. I didn't get the house sale money. I didn't get hit the list. Sometimes I think we take score a little bit too soon, don't you? I mean, who knows what's to happen or what's to change? And like, why do the result? Well, I know we all want, want like results now. We don't want results in a year or two years. But do you think that we just, we, ru like, we rush straight to, oh, that was a failure or that was something that didn't work out? We just jump to that a bit too quickly? Well, I think that unfortunately, and then there's some evolutionary reasons why that is, um, uh, so as we evolved as a species, uh, we uh, are highly attuned to threat, right? Because that mm -hmm. puts our life at risk. So on the savannah in Africa, mm -hmm. you know, if from experience or observation, uh, you know, if the grass is moving and you don't see anything, there might be a lion or a leopard or something there. And then you suddenly go, oh, my God. And then your whole uh, sympathetic nervous system is activated and you run away and run up a tree or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the problem is that Things uh, that are often occurring that are negative, they're like uh, sticky post-it notes. They stick to you, mm -hmm. right? And, and oftentimes, these are statements uh, about yourself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and unfortunately, also, by the nature of how many of us have grown up or our backgrounds, there are many things that have hurt us, and those are more st uh, sticky post-it notes we put on ourselves. And so we're covered in these, and so uh, we have a tendency to be hypercritical about ourselves. And this is a truism uh, uh, of everyone. And although, you know, it's funny, I'll... Uh, I'll ask this question, how many people are self-critical or uh, repeatedly tell themselves they're not good enough, they're not smart enough, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, usually the vast majority of people raise their hand and I say, for the people who don't, you're lying. I, I just, <laughs> right, right. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, 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 everyone has this and, and the challenge is understanding where it comes from mm -hmm. two, understanding it's not truth mm -hmm. and three having no emotional response to it and and this is the nature of some mindfulness practices uh, but the other side of it is also you have within your ability uh, to change the narrative from mm -hmm. one of negativity to one of positivity uh, and again, we we're talking about intention by repeatedly making statements, I'm good enough, I'm worthy, I deserve love, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, diminishes that negative self-talk. And uh, so none of us will make it go 100% away, but uh, mm -hmm. it will certainly diminish it. And when you see it for what it is, and this is this idea of sort of metacognition, mm -hmm. where you're not lost in that, but you're an observer seeing what's really going on there, you can sit there and say, you know, that's bullshit. Mm. I mean, sometimes I feel like confident and capable if I'm doing something, especially if it feels familiar and there's, is, say it's a repetitive task. And in the same breath, I can also feel inadequate and yet still take the action. So do you feel that sometimes taking the action, I mean, this is really what everyone talks about imposter syndrome and, you know, uh, do, um, following through even though, you know, courage isn't the absence of fear. It's, you know, acting with, with the fear. Do you find that if we encourage ourselves, even when we're like, yeah, I don't know, like I, I am new to this, or um, maybe this won't be utterly perfect, but I'm still willing to do it. Does that also build our manifestation muscles? Does that also put us in well, No, I think that's right. And, and you know, it's funny you say that because um, 
as an example, I get asked to talk about different things or mm-hmm. to do different things. And to be honest with you, some of them, I have no fucking clue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and like, talk about um, leadership when it comes to X, Y, Z types of people. And you go, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, and you find out, and, and, and what's interesting is that first of all, many of us are so much more capable than we believe. And the other aspect mm. is uh, mm-hmm. nervousness or fear uh, uh, diminishes your executive control function. So you lose access to memory and experiences. So then mm. it only gets worse, right? Because you can't recall anything and you're up in front of a crowd. And then you're thinking, now everyone's judging me and it only exacerbates it. And mm-hmm. so... Um, uh, my own experience, and this is not to say that I was not in that position, uh, but uh, in one of the first experiences uh, um, uh, that I had where I had to stand in front of a large group of people mm-hmm. and speak, uh, uh, I was actually terrified. Mm-hmm. And in fact, it, it actually happened uh, the first time I was hosting an event with the Dalai Lama. And even though, you know, I'd spoken before, but it wasn't in front of a large crowd. And of course, I translated this. Everybody's going to think I'm an idiot. I I don't know what I'm doing. And I uh, actually ended up going to a speaking coach. Mm -hmm. And 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 for really three sessions where it was basically him and I just chatting. uh, um, And in that instance, because what I found I would do when I was anxious and nervous is I would start speaking really fast Mm -hmm. to the point where. You know, I'm not making no sense, but I just think somehow if I keep talking, it'll all make sense. Uh, <laughs> you want to get over with, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and then I, I, after spending time with him, I, I just realized that, first of all, you know, I'm fairly well educated. I'm fairly experienced. And who gives a fuck what other people say? <laughs> <laughs> well, no one's going to think the same thing anyway, right? Yeah, if well. Speaking, if you speak in front of a thousand people, there are a thousand opinions, right? So Yeah, well. But, but, you know, you don't want people to go, wow, the guy was really nervous up there and he really yeah. screwed this up. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, my point was that suddenly I felt relaxed. I wasn't in fear because it didn't matter. You know, I've done enough things uh, in my life and have been successful on different fronts. Mm-hmm. Who has the right to criticize me when I'm doing the best I can? And that's all we, any of us can do. So I, mm-hmm. again, in some ways I changed and, and it's, Maybe it's the opposite of what we're talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. In in this case, uh, you know, so many people are fearful of what people think that it impacts them mm-hmm. versus saying, you know, I have enough confidence in myself. I am okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you accept that. And then everything becomes easy. Uh, you know, I used to, uh, again, be trapped when I would ask, be asked to give public lectures where, okay, I've got to have this slideshow. It's got to be perfect. And I've got to rehearse mm-hmm. it. And I would go through it. And, I, and it actually wasn't helpful because, uh, you know, oftentimes you're trying to play off the crowd, but you're stuck in this slideshow. And I finally just uh, said, fuck it. And I just uh, stopped making slides and I just went out there and just talked. And and the thing is, people love it because you're natural, you're relaxed. It's evident that this isn't a canned speech mm-hmm. and you're human and you're vulnerable. And in fact, you know, I oftentimes will tell stories that are very painful uh, to relive in front of an audience but the thing about it is that when you show that vulnerability or humanity, no one criticizes you. In fact, almost everyone wants to embrace you. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I gave a talk one time where my voice cracked and I shed a tear, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And afterwards, a woman comes up to me and there are like 250 people there. A woman comes mm-hmm. up, she says, you know, thank you so much. Can I give you a hug? Mm-hmm. I said, of course. Well, essentially... 250 people gave me hugs. <laughs> and, 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 what, and, and what's funny is to contrast with this, I was given a talk. And again, same thing happened because I tell these stories and I'm not afraid to tell these personal stories. And uh, a woman comes up and she goes, I felt so sorry for you up there. And I go, well, why? And she goes, well, your voice cracked and, and it was obvious you were emotional. And I'm sure you just felt horrible that all these people were watching this breakdown. And I'm like <laughs> looking at her going, you know, like, 
<laughs> and she goes, I'm a psychiatrist and a hypnotist. And if you see me for three sessions, I'll get rid of that. And I'm like, going, are you out of your mind? I, I, I mean, on some level, being able to sit with that and be okay with it is a superpower, right? Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. And yeah, and self-compassion too is such a big theme in the book. I know that you say here that it's actually like kryptonite to our criticism, right? To our self-criticism, being able to have compassion. Why is self-compassion so impossible, especially with women? I feel like we, may, I don't know, maybe it's equally true for men, but I tend to work more with women and I just realize how they're so hard on themselves about small things, about things that seem really significant. And it's it's endless. Even though they are very smart, they know no one has to be perfect. They don't expect that of anybody else. Like I would say, would you say that to me if, if I did that? And they're of like, course not. Right, right. If I, no, I'm, no. Uh, uh, people are harder on themselves than they are on anyone in their circles. Yes. And uh, it, it's sad. And it doesn't have mm-hmm. to be that way. And mm-hmm. But again, it comes from an insecurity that you have and that probably has been ingrained uh, mm-hmm. uh, early on. And, uh, uh, and so you can change it. And as we were talking about, mm-hmm. you just have to be able to uh, learn that you're okay. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the challenges uh, for all of us is, uh, you know, we have this shadow self, uh, if you want to refer to Jungian philosophy. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's this mixture of all the bad things we think about ourselves, uh, uh, as well as things that uh, we should have done but didn't, could have done but mm-hmm. didn't, and et cetera, et cetera. And we failed people, and we lied. We may have cheated. We may have done, you know, bad stuff. And uh, and we sit there and carry this thing, mm-hmm. and we're ashamed of it. And we want it to go away and we don't want it to be part of us. And the same with these insecurities and all of these other things. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the problem is the more you force it away from you, the more powerful it becomes. And what I mean by that is it's not going to go away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is part of you. You, you should not try to force it away because when you're weak, when you're vulnerable, when you're hungry, uh, these are the times when you have given that thing power, which then takes over and, uh, you know, you do things that you regret or uh, do very negative things. The thing is, you have to integrate it into who you are, accept it, acknowledge it. And it's OK because everyone has that. And once you're able to do that, you, you don't carry this constant fear about being found out. You know, it's like uh, you were mentioning your your women friends and it was more prevalent. I don't know whether that's true or not. But the Mm -hmm. fact of the matter is we are who we are. All of us are worthy. All of us deserve love. And there, I mean, frankly, uh, we're all frail, fragile uh, human beings. And it's okay. You know, uh, and so, you know, whether you're, you're crying, whether you're hurt, whether you're in pain, that is the human condition. And in being able to accept someone and be non judgmental, being compassionate, being empathic, you know, these are critical uh, attributes that by being that way towards others, you also hopefully end up being that way towards yourself. Now, sadly, there are people in some of the caring professions who because of their own damage, uh, they, you know, feel that they have to help everybody and they'll kill themselves to help help everybody. But inside they're in horrible pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you have to take care of yourself. You have to care for yourself. You have to love yourself. Mm -hmm. Now you hear me saying this and you go, well, yeah, that's easy for him to say. Uh, Well, it's not easy for me to say because I fail repeatedly. I do not live up to all of, uh, of the things I would like to be, uh, but I, it's okay. And mm. uh, I think we all have to be able to say, I'm okay. And I'm not perfect. I, you could argue um, uh, I'm. Uh, there's a woman named Poppy Jamie, I think, or maybe it's the other way around, but she has a podcast called Imperfectly Perfect. Mm. And I think that's, uh, uh, yeah. that's the way we all are. You know, and you say in the book too, which I really like, that you, you say, look, staying on course is a daily struggle. It's, 
It's interesting because uh, people often see me too, and I am very optimistic and I do a lot of work on my own mind and I'm very conscious and intentional about what I think in the morning. And if I start to feel negative emotion, I, I do a lot of belief work in my actual business. Like we have an amazing membership, which I love so much. And we examine our beliefs constantly, especially, well, really only the ones that make us feel bad. So staying on course is, is work, right? Because I think that sometimes people think, oh no, there are some people that are just really tapped into some magical force. That's what mind magic is for, for a lucky few who just who just get it, right? Or there are some people who who just got, who are just blessed, things just go their way. That's not true, right? Stuff goes, like life goes wrong. I mean, I read your book. I know what you've experienced. Like there's been tough stuff. Do you think that, I mean, this is a question that I get sometimes because people I think can be a bit scared of this. They think, do we manifest the bad things, right? So that the bad health report, like say a diagnosis or the person just walking and leaving us and it was a, a complete surprise or losing a job. What What's your experience or take in those situations? Well, uh, again, uh, yes, we have some ability to manifest but uh, that being said, uh, there are externalities that impact us as well and that we don't have control over. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody getting cancer, generally speaking, is because they're bad people. Uh, it just happens. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, now that's not to say that how you view the world uh, doesn't have an impact Uh as an example, I mean, we know that people who are constantly negative mm -hmm. uh, and constantly um, uh, stimulate their sympathetic nervous system, uh, which is a very unhealthy thing, uh, mm -hmm. oftentimes get sick. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, uh, we know that, as an example, children with ACEs, uh, this adverse childhood experiences where, mm -hmm. you know, they're some abuse, uh, uh, whether it's physical, mental, sexual abuse, uh, if there's drug and alcohol in their background and their parents, if uh, they live in poverty, uh, these types of things have a profound effect on your physiology. And, mm -hmm. and oftentimes these people have negative attitudes about everything. Mm -hmm. And as a result, this gets manifested. Uh, oftentimes, uh, these people are not successful because they haven't learned the tools to function in modern society. They oftentimes uh, have not finished their education. Oftentimes, because of their exposure to drug and alcohol abuse, they uh, become abusers themselves. And, and at the end of the day, they have a variety of chronic diseases. Um, so, yes, I, I think your mental attitude can um, profoundly affect your health. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other side of it is none of us are immune. And this is the sad thing about ultra wealthy people, even wealthy people. They think that having money protects them. Mm. Uh, none of us are in control. Mm. Uh, we pretend we're in control, uh, but we're not. Uh, we have some ability to have an influence, mm. but it's not absolute. And I think that's what you're talking about. But mm -hmm. the difference is that let's say if you're diagnosed with cancer, we know that your mental attitude can have a profound effect. Now, I'm not saying it'll cure your cancer, mm -hmm. but it can certainly affect uh, it in terms of how fast it grows mm -hmm. uh, or um, uh, just how you mentally respond. Because, you know, there's a subset of people, they'll get uh, a diagnosis like that and they'll go, oh, my life's over. This is horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, versus other people say, well, listen, I've led a good life. I've had wonderful privilege. I've, you know, been with my family. It's been incredible. I'm very fortunate and, uh, uh, I'm thankful regardless of what happens versus going, Oh my God, this is horrible. I'm not able to do this and that. And I wanted this and life is so unfair and life's horrible. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, again, frankly, life is unfair. It mm -hmm. just is. And as much as we can put, try to put icing on that cake, Life is unfair. There are people who are horrible human beings who seemingly uh, are incredibly successful. And there are people who are uh, saints who deserve every blessing who get nothing. And, uh, and this is why, you know, the 
first sentence of the book, the universe doesn't give a fuck about you, Mm -hmm. but you can give a fuck about you and you can give a fuck about everyone around you. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, you can improve the lives of others. You can improve your own life by having an open heart, Mm -hmm. embracing people and demonstrating uh, this unconditional love. And when you're able to sit with that and hold that, that is the most powerful thing in the world. And whether you're, you're able to do that for a second or a lifetime, it is elevating, it's profound, and that is the purpose for why we're here in this world. And you give so many amazing exercises in this book that we can do, like like laid out for us, like so much is included here. Like there's so much value in this book. What's your daily practice to stay on course with how you feel and managing your own emotions and staying on track? Uh, well, I'm a failure repeatedly. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think we all are, yeah. Well, okay. but, but, uh, yeah, but you right. see, this is the problem is, uh, uh, you know, people ascribe to individuals sort of these uh, incredible uh, abilities. And don't get me wrong. I mean, there are individuals who are extraordinarily disciplined and do X, Y, and Z every day. Uh, I would like to say I'm one of them, but I am not, and mm-hmm. uh, I accept that. Uh, but I try the best I can. Uh, and again, it's the trying and being the do the best you can. It's not perfection. I, again, uh, uh, we're all human beings. So yes, I try to live up to what I write about, uh, but uh, you know. I am not perfect. You know, it's funny. There was a movie that uh, Gotham uh, Chopra did about his father, Deepak. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, the people, you know, uh, have this view that, you know, he gets up and he does, he gets up at three and does yoga for three hours. And then he does this. And (laughs) And his crystals. And and, 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 and then, you know, Gotham filmed him and he's like, you know, knocking on his door and he's like, you wake, you know, going, oh God, what time is? Well, it's, you know, nine o'clock. Oh, God, okay. I've got, you know, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> and he has a bacon sandwich and a beer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I, I, I'm not sure about that, but certainly he's a, a human being. And, you know, I've had the joy and the pleasure uh, to spend a lot of time with uh, probably more spiritual leaders than anyone alive, frankly. And whether that's mm-hmm. the Pope, Tutu, the Dalai Lama, mm-hmm. Sri Sri, Sadhguru, uh, on and on and on, Eckhart Tolle, etc. Every one of these people are human beings. Mm-hmm. And the fantasy that gets built around how they live or uh, it's a fantasy. They are human beings. Now, that's not to say that they're not elevated spiritual beings. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a slightly different conversation. But they all are human beings who suffer, who are in pain, who hurt. And uh, uh, that's just reality. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I've seen the Dalai Lama uh, cry. But I've also seen him really fucking pissed. And so, uh, you know, it's not like there's this, oh, yeah. My yeah, dear. it's not a lifelong meditation. Right? Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. So uh, it's, uh, I, I think that's the takeaway. And even sometimes people, because, you know, I shared so much in, in uh, my first book, and I mm-hmm. think in this one somewhat, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, they have this false notion that uh, I'm somehow uh, perfect and have insight and uh, mm-hmm. about everything. And look, I, no, I, mm-hmm. I do the best I can. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. I, I tell a story. Uh, um, I was uh, on stage with the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala one time at his uh, uh, residence doing an event. And there was a woman in the audience who clearly was a socialite type. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, Richard Gere was there and she was sort of moving over the few days towards Richard Gere because <laughs> he, was, he was important, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then a few weeks later, I'm in Los Angeles doing an event with Eckhart Tolle. And amazingly, the same woman is there, okay? And she's in the front row, and uh, right? And then I, the next time, I, uh, I'm on stage with Amma, the hugging saint, mm-hmm. and uh, doing something or other. And I look at the audience, and this woman's in the front row again. And I'm going, <laughs> holy 
shit. I, I, I mean, uh, uh, and so I am hosting an event at Stanford and we have a reception afterwards. And lo and behold, this woman shows up mm-hmm. and uh, uh, she says, you know, I've watched you and God, I, it was amazing. You're you, like, you know, the Dalai Lama and you're with him on stage and, you know, Eckhart and, and Amma's really close to you. And she goes, obviously you have something. Uh, and she goes, I want you to be my guru. I said, really? She goes, oh, absolutely. I'll do anything. And uh, I said, anything? Oh, absolutely. You know, you name it. If you'll be my mentor and my guru, you know, I'll do anything so that I get the insights and awareness, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, uh, then here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you a list of 100 books. I want you to read for four hours a day. I want you to meditate for two hours a day. And then I want you to journal for two hours a day. She goes, that's eight hours a day. And I said, yes. I said, you know, this does not come for free. You have to work uh, uh, to get to the place where, you know, you have these types of insights and things like this. And and it's, it, it's not one book. You have to spend a lot of time trying to understand these things and gain insights and awareness and the power of these narratives. Mm-hmm. And she said, but I mean, that'll take forever. I said, well, yeah, I mean, it's going to take a few months probably. <laughs> and she goes, well, but, but what am I going to learn at this? And are you going to be mentoring the whole time? And I said, no, when you're done with this, you'll come back to me. And she goes, but what will you tell me? What, what will I have learned? And I'll say, well, if you've done it correctly, when you come back to me, you'll say, I don't need you at all because everything was in those books. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, she chose not to follow that path. <laughs> but you're, but it's interesting, right? Like it's we're always looking for a quick solution, right? It's like, how do I just feel good? But that's why it's so easy to buy something or to drink something or to eat something, right? It's like it's oh, what's the like? How do we get there? And it's like, well, you know, you've got to read the things, you got to try the things, you kind of got to go inside. Well, bit. exactly. And, and the thing is, what so many people uh, uh, don't understand, it's your mental attitude. It's not any of these other things. Yes, you can exercise. Yes, you can eat a, a, a quote unquote right diet, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it is your choice about everything that happens to you in the sense of how you respond to it. You know, mm-hmm. an event in and of itself has no valence. It's neither good nor bad. Mm-hmm. It is how you respond to the event and then how you embed that into your subconscious. Mm-hmm. That gives it its power. So anytime you think of that event, a- every time you run into a person who was responsible for that negative event, you have this mm-hmm. immense reaction and, uh, and of course, it's a negative reaction. And this is the whole idea of forgiveness, uh, because it's not about the other person. It's about you. And it's like you're, you're drinking poison, somehow thinking that that is going to make the other person suffer because they hurt you. And of course, that's ridiculous. And so you just have to let it go. And this is not to say you forget about it. It's not to say you don't remain cautious. But all of that negativity, you don't have to carry. Mm -hmm. And I think the greatest gift I or anyone can give somebody is to release them Mm -hmm. and to um, uh, make them understand that their happiness is their choice. And it doesn't matter the external events. You know, Epictetus, who was a slave uh, during the Roman times, you know, he made a profound statement. He said, uh, I cannot control uh, that I'm a slave. I cannot control what I uh, am required to do, but I can control uh, how I respond to that and how I think about that. And uh, all of us have that choice. Uh, This is like, you know, uh, as an example, uh, I know an individual from a, uh, who has a very humble job, and he is the happiest person to be around. Mm-hmm. And in fact, uh, I, uh, he works at a cafe as a, as a waiter. I go there specifically 
just to be with his energy. <laughs> yes, yes. Because he's so happy. He's so grateful. And, and just being in his presence reminds me of how blessed I am. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, another statement that people say is to hang around with people you admire mm-hmm. who you aspire to be like versus hanging around with people who always are negative or always, uh, you know, promoting the bad aspects of, of uh, our humanity. And now don't get me wrong, sometimes I go off on a diatribe like that, mm-hmm. uh, but I try not to. Right. And again, uh, what I keep emphasizing, which I'm sure you appreciate, mm-hmm. is uh, the fact that I am not perfect and I'm a mm-hmm. human being and I screw up and fuck up as much as anyone. Mm-hmm. And um, I still deserve to be loved, just like mm-hmm. you do. You know? So... Dr. James Doty, what is your intention for Mind Magic when this is released into the world into so many different, you know, pairs of hands? Like, oh gosh, what is this? Like, how do I understand the neuroscience behind manifesting? Like, how can I use this in my life? What's your, from your heart, what's your intention? Well, hopefully, uh, you know, the book is explicit enough to uh, give you insights and techniques that will allow you to, you know, maximize your own ability. Mm -hmm. Uh, to manifest. But just as importantly, it hopefully gives you some insights about what's important Mm -hmm. that you should focus on and not what you think or what society says you should focus on. I think the other powerful message is that many people give away their Mm self-agency. As I said earlier, people have an immense, immense power within themselves. Mm -hmm. They just don't know it or believe it. Mm -hmm. And when you're able to get in touch with that, uh, it changes everything. And uh, hopefully uh, this book is a guide for you to um, recognize your own power, uh, to act on that, and by doing so, make the world a better place. And I think that's the important thing at the end. As I said earlier, sure, it would be great if the book did well, but that's not the point. The point is that I believe that there are some messages in there that could help people. And again, if it only helps one person, I, I'm blessed and thankful, and uh, I have no other aspirations. Uh I'm just not attached to that. I did the best I could. I tried to analyze it. I tried to put it out there in a a readable fashion Mm -hmm. and hopefully it's helpful. And, uh, uh, that's all. There's no other added aspect to it. Oh, and here we are. And you can even just feel like through the lack of detachment, the love, like just the, I did my best for you. Here it is. It's coming, friends. My gosh, mind magic. And where do you recommend everyone just go to, ch- to find out more about you, work with you, get all the things? Uh, well, uh, you can search the internet, and sadly and nauseatingly, uh, there are probably a million <laughs> podcasts out there that I've been on. Uh, uh, the <laughs> you can... <laughs> you can uh, uh, go to uh, the website of the center I run at Stanford, the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. And that website is ccare, C-C-A-R-E dot Stanford dot edu. And uh, there are many uh, programs that we have there, which I think uh, might benefit uh, many of your listeners. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. I also actually have a podcast, which maybe you do or don't know. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, um, uh, there is a podcast called Into the Magic Shop, and if anyone is uh, interested, there are some, a few interesting characters. Uh, let's see. Uh, remember Warner Earhart? Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I, I, as I said, I'm very blessed to have a, a number of friends, but Warner's a good friend, and he did actually a, a profound podcast. Uh, um, who else is there? Uh Sam Harris, you know, Sam Harris has a podcast. Yeah. Uh, he was on there. Uh, anyway. It's a candy uh, store. I, it's a candy store out it there. Is. Yeah. It is. In fact, did you know Stephen Fry? The oh, UK. Uh, yes. 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 He, he and I had a wonderful uh, time. And uh, actually, John Hamm and I did one together. 
So uh, it's a very eclectic collection of individuals, but it's all about uh, um, kindness, compassion, love, accepting yourself. And I, I mean, that's really the, the goal of it. Oh, Dr. Doty, what a conversation. Thank you so much for your time, your love, your expertise. <gasps> My friends, you've been given your instructions. So many great places to go, things to read, listen to, consume to improve your life experience starting now. So until next time, my friends, so much love and peace. Yes. And, you know, you can pre-order the book now. Uh, yes. So please do. And I'm mm-hmm. sure you will leave a link uh, for that as well. Absolutely. So. Plus a book giveaway. Oh, yes. Oh, That's oh yes. Love yes. To do, so. All right. <laughs> Uh, Susie's going to give away 100,000 books. Uh, So just uh, sign up now. Mind (laughs) magic. Mind magic. Yes, (laughs) yes. Thank you, Dr. Doty. Thank you, everybody. Until tomorrow.